Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who may be joining us. I can see everyone coming into the room who's just been in the waiting room. So just going to give it one moment for everybody to join with us. Fantastic. Hello, everybody. Welcome. We'll kick off in just a few seconds. Wonderful. Let's do it and others can join as they can. Once again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, wherever you may be joining from. We're so glad you're here with us and cannot wait to share what we have in store for the next hour with you all. My name is Megan and I'm the Events and Programs Manager at the Australian Global Citizen Office here in Melbourne, Australia. I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung, the traditional owners of the land where I live and work and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Welcome to everyone on this call from around Australia, New Zealand, Samoa and friends and colleagues who are joining from around the world. It's wonderful to have you. So we're here to honour International Women's Day, which means different things to different people. This year's theme is Choose to Challenge. Personally, I've sought to land on a neat way to wrap up the discourse around the rights of women and girls we've seen in Australia over the last couple of weeks, and in turn, what that means for our work. But I don't think that's possible. A global citizen, we want to have conversations that not just challenge, but inspire you, inform you, and empower you to believe that your voice can change the course of the lives of millions of people living around the world in extreme poverty. We believe that conversation is where that begins. Over the next hour, we hope that the discussion we have does at least one of those things for you. Firstly, though, before we kick off, a little bit of housekeeping from me. During this discussion, we will be covering the topic of domestic violence, a scourge that affects our region disproportionately. We want to let you know in case this topic is triggering for anybody joining us today. We want to make today just that, however, a conversation which means we'd love for you to get as involved as little or as much as you would like. Throughout the event, please submit any questions that come to mind in the Q&A box you see at the bottom of the screen. And we'll be answering some of them towards the end. Next, I'd love to invite everybody here to introduce themselves by sharing their name and where they're joining from so we can say hello in the chat box. Also in the menu you can see at the bottom of your screen. And I can see people starting to do that already, which is wonderful. We have assembled a stellar lineup of speakers today, and I'm shortly going to get out of the way so we can get into it. Global Citizen has been running what we call these grassroots events for a number of years now, more recently virtually, and it is always a pleasure when we get to do so with our friends and partners who share our vision of a world without extreme poverty. Results Australia is one such longtime friend and partner, and we have campaigned together over many years to see governments pledge millions of dollars for global health, gender equality, and education in our region. And we're thrilled to be presenting this event today in partnership with them. Results Australia's CEO, Megaya Chorley, is our moderator today, and I'm delighted to hand over to her next. Megaya has over 20 years of experience working in human rights and she has worked with communities in Africa, Asia and the Pacific Islands. She has a particular passion for bringing together policymakers and representatives from marginalised groups to collectively shape solutions. Megaya will introduce our panellists to you, but first, I am particularly excited to share an exclusive message with you from Global Citizens National Advocate, ARIA Award winning artist and passionate activist, Delta Goodrum. Don't forget to say hello in the chat box in the meantime, and I'll see you all again at the end. Hi everyone, it's Delta Goodrum here, and I am delighted to wish you all a very happy International Women's Day for 2021. This year's theme, Women in Leadership, is one that I connect with deeply, having been surrounded by strong and inspiring women throughout my career and throughout my life. But not everyone is so fortunate. 
And around the world, and particularly in our region, we know that COVID-19 and climate change is having a disproportionate impact on women and girls living in marginalised communities, including those living in extreme poverty. We also know that empowering women to make decisions about their future results in better outcomes for their communities across health, education, the environment and beyond. We can tackle these barriers and create change by using our collective voice. I am delighted to add my voice to this campaign and call on everyone here to join me in taking action today. Over the next hour, you're going to hear more on how you can do that as well as from some incredible speakers who have dedicated not only their careers, but lives to leaving the world a better place for women and girls. I wanted to thank Global Citizen and Results Australia for shining a light on these issues today and every day in their work alongside UN Women and the Asia Foundation. And most importantly, I thank you all here today for making the time to be here. Enjoy the event, everyone, and happy International Women's Day once again. I'm sending all my love and light from my heart to all of yours. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. And thank you, Delta. That was wonderful. Um, I also want to extend a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. I've noticed in the chat box we've got people from all around the world, which is wonderful. Um, I want to pay my respects to the traditional custodians whose lands we live and work on, and also acknowledge the deep spiritual connection and the relationship that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have to country. Today, I'm on the lands of the Karana people in South Australia. So we have a fabulous lineup of panelists for you today. We've got Ari Goering, who's the CEO of the Pollination Foundation. They do fabulous work. I strongly suggest you check them out. Um, Natasha Dr. Spoyer, who is Global Citizen Board Director. She's also currently representative to the UN Committee for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, also known as CEDAW. We've got Jane Sloan, who is the Senior Director, Women's Empowerment and Gender Equality at the Asia Foundation. Jane is normally based in San Francisco. We're lucky to have her with us today, um, calling in from Australia. And we've also got Mele Malaval, I hope I pronounced that properly, who joins us from UN Women in Samoa. A very warm welcome to you, especially in um, the Pacific. Mele, it's fabulous to have you with us. So all of these women are change makers and all of them have rich lived experience. But rather than reading from their incredibly impressive bios, what I wanna invite them to do is to share just three things that they want us to know about them. I'm gonna start with you, Ari. Thanks, Nagaya. Um, I too just wanna to acknowledge that I am here on the Kulin Nations, the lands of the Boon Wurrung people in South Melbourne. Uh, and three things about me. I am a mother of two gorgeous young women. Um, I think about becoming a grandmother and I think about what that means and the legacy we leave for our future generations. I spent more than 20 years living and working in a very remote part of the world, the northwest of Australia, the Kimberley region, uh, supporting the development of indigenous led models of conservation. Um, and most importantly, I think I'm a fire starter. <laughs> so both metaphorically and literally, um, when I set a course towards a vision and people say it's impossible, it just kind of adds fuel to my fire. Uh, but I also love to light fires, uh, particularly on country with indigenous people and spin effects makes a beautiful sound as it's crackling uh, across the landscape. So that's me. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand over to Natasha. Three things you'd like us to know about you. Hello, everyone from all over the world. I too acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm on, the Ghana land uh, and the Ghana people. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and other elders from other communities who may be listen listening or watching us today. Three things. I'm a lifelong feminist, so I'm not afraid of the F word. Uh, I am passionate uh, in my work these days about eliminating violence against women and girls. So that's my work at uh, Our Watch. 
and yeah, I'm a recovered politician. <laughs> Thank you so much. Over to you, Jane. Well, I'd also like to acknowledge that at the moment I'm on beautiful Ghana land and also want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, like Ari, I'm an Atlantic fellow connected to a core of global practitioners working to address inequalities. Uh, and I know that there are other Atlantic fellows joining us today. And I'd like to encourage all of you listening to apply to this incredible 20 year fellowship. Uh, I'm writing a book about my journey to uh, feminist uh, movement building and um, really passionate about that work and like Natasha, not at all afraid to use the F word. And as Nagea mentioned, while I'm in Australia at present, normally I live on a small wooden boat in Sausalito in California in a community of artists and activists, uh, just a ferry ride across the harbour to San Francisco where the Asia Foundation's head office is based. So I feel like I have the best of both worlds being here at the moment and having my beautiful boat back there. Thank you so much, Mele. Uh, thank you. Well, talofa lava, olo suafa, papali'i mele mawale iwa. So um, I thank uh, not only my ancestors, my foremothers and forefathers, but all of those who contribute to our land here in Samoa, of which we own and are independent. So we're very grateful to be able to have that. Um, three things to know about me. Uh, the first is that I've been working with UN Women for nine years, ever since this office was first established here in Samoa. And I actually cover Cook Islands, Tokelau, and New Way as well. So it's really an honor to be able to work with so many different Polynesian cultures um, under the umbrella of UN Women. Uh, uh, things that give me inspiration, because I know we want to talk about inspiration and hope um, throughout uh, today, is, uh, is actually seeing young women and women of other generations come together and support and uplift each other uh, through a variety of different modes, whether it be for the arts, music, um, their community-based activities. Um, this always gives me the type of light that um, Ari was mentioning, but uh, instead of it being um, something that could be dangerous, it becomes something that's um, um, healing and uh, we all collect around together. And another, a third thing is I like to play the ukulele. So um, if we decide to do a sing-along after this, uh, I'll, I'll be ready. <laughs> thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you. I'm going to quote from a man now, and I do so because this is the right quote for this moment. In A Tale of Two Cities, Charles Dickens suggests, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. So over the next 45 minutes, we're going to cover some of the dark moments of the last year, which of course has been characterised by a virus that's killed over 2 million people and left millions of additional people in extreme poverty. We've also seen an alarming rise in gender-based violence. And on top of that, we're going to look at climate change, which of course is one of the defining challenges of our time but I will not have done my job unless you walk away today with a great sense of hope for the future because all of these women have a vision of what is possible. They understand the stakes. They are right at the forefront of building the solutions. Jane, Ari, Natasha and Mele believe that with the right kind of leadership, investment, partnerships and creative thinking that we have everything before us. So I'm going to start with some of the darkness. The last few weeks have been unprecedented in Australian federal politics and have created a sense of crisis and I think significant pain for many Australians. So Natasha, I'm going to start with you. As a former federal parliamentarian, what do you hope that we will learn from this moment and what key changes do you hope to see in Canberra as a result? Thank you for that question. Uh, you're right, it's hard not to be aware of, confronted by, uh, made angry and frustrated by, and even triggered by the events of the last few weeks. What do I hope it will bring about? Absolutely sweeping and radical. 
wholesale change uh, across society, but specifically in the corridors of power. I think this potentially is a watershed moment and I am focused on the way that we can achieve this change because it's not only policy change, it's not only structural, potentially structural change, but the hardest thing of all, as we all know, is cultural change. And that's what's required before politics and parliament present not only a safe, respectful working environment for everyone, but specifically for women of all backgrounds, but so that we can actually have representative and powerful institutions that reflect our diversity and difference. Um, I'm trying to be positive, but I'm not going to pretend that I haven't found personally the last few weeks really very distressing. Uh, I was 22 when I started working in Parliament House, so we've all got our experiences and stories. I was a relatively young senator, 26, when I first entered federal parliament and many of you um, might remember some of the sexism and ridiculous stereotypes that played out in terms of my life and career and while I had hoped things would be better 25 years later the one thing that has changed are the movements that are calling out these double standards and bad behavior so we have good reason to be optimistic because women are not putting up with this anymore and our culture of parliament and politics has to change. So again, my, my message to women and men, but particularly women, gender diverse, non-binary people listening today, especially from diverse backgrounds, don't give up on politics just because politics looks like it's given up on you. Thank you so much, Natasha. My next question is again to you, and I'll get to the other panelists in a moment. But I wanted to touch on a, a subject that's very close to your heart. You're the founding chair of Our Watch, the National Foundation to Prevent Violence Against Women and Their Children. So you have a deep understanding of the issues of violence. And of course, the last year has been like no other with what the UN has characterised as a shadow pandemic of gender-based violence. So can you talk to us a little bit about those trends over the last year as a result of COVID-19 and, and what you think are some of the causes? Well, those trends you will have seen replicated uh, in our region and across the world, and that is one of the worst, uh, most heinous manifestations or consequences of the pandemic, and specifically some of the techniques we've used to try and alleviate the impact of the pandemic, such as lockdown. This has seen an increase in women's experience of violence, and we know that includes first-time violence, the rate of violence, the severity of that violence, and even COVID-19 sort of being weaponized weaponized as a tool itself. Obviously, there are many different statistics across the world. We know that women who are already experiencing discrimination and disadvantage are more likely uh, to be affected by this discrimination. And in our country, in Australia, that includes women with disabilities, uh, women from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, and of course, our national shame, the rates of violence against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. So what we have to remember though, is that while the pandemic has seen an exacerbation uh, in this violence and indeed in gender inequalities and inequality generally, whether that's in the home or the workplace, that is not the cause of this violence. We know that the underlying drivers of violence against women and children particularly are things such as adherence to rigid gender stereotypes, limiting of women's independence, disrespect for women, and I guess those male uh, aggressive male relationships that um, highlight hypermasculinity or disrespect for women. So the pandemic has exacerbated this violence, but it is not the cause, even though I don't underestimate the financial stress, social and work dislocation, so many other issues and, and, and aspects of it. So we have to tackle those underlying causes, and that means behaviours and attitudes, which aren't linear. But that means gender inequality being tackled because we know at the core of gendered violence, gender inequality is there. So what's the heart of the solution? Gender equality. I don't mean to make it sound too simple, but obviously we've got a lot of things to tackle and that gender equality piece has been made harder by a pandemic that has seen women and girls disproportionately affected, be that economically or socially. We're the shock absorbers of the pandemic. Um, according to one source. And you're right, it is the shadow pandemic as UN women have literally described it. But there's hope because violence is preventable. And I hope that's something that uh, everyone 
is committed to uh, being involved in as their mission as well as mine. Thank you so much, Natasha. Mele, I'm going to move over to you. Um, as we all know, being in Australia, that the Pacific is an extraordinary region. It's home for a rich and diverse set of cultures and histories, but it's also a region that has a long way to go in tackling violence against women and children. So can you talk to us about, particularly about this issue, but in particular what you've seen over the last year as a result of COVID-19 and whether it's compounded some of those risk factors for women? Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, of course, I'll be speaking about Samoa, Kupa and Sokolan Uwe, the countries that I deal with most directly, but um, I can give you some idea of the regional scope as well. So globally, one in three women experience gender-based violence in their lifetime. When we move to the Pacific, that's two out of three. So that number increases dramatically. And unfortunately here in Samoa, at least 46% of women experience some form of gender-based violence in their lifetime and 86% uh, experience some sort of intimate partner violence in their lifetime. So that's quite dramatic. Um, now, in Samoa, we experienced uh, lockdowns, but we, of course, did not have COVID here. So um, I think we were a little bit prepared because, as you know, we had the measles crisis that occurred in 2019, where we had a similar scenario where the entire nation pretty much had to shut down so that we could vaccinate everyone properly. Um, but what we do know from statistics from last year in Samoa uh, is that we had a 48% increase of gender-based violence that was reported, now I remind you reported, um, during the COVID lockdowns. Where we're grateful for the global work, the global rapid assessments that UN Women and other um, organizations have done is that they actually took the time and made the effort to collect that information. Now, we have the measles lockdown that occurred literally the year before. We have zero information on gender-based violence, even though we had very similar scenarios. But there was no heightened awareness of the realities of how lockdowns can actually affect women. So, so this is a, uh, for us in Samoa, it was a very clear opportunity to really highlight these issues in a way that we had never um, been able to before, because all of a sudden everybody was talking about it around the world. I mean, we have some examples globally of up to 300% increase in gender-based violence in some parts of the world. So um, it's unfortunate, but I'm so glad that we actually have that data. We have that information so that we're prepared. And, and we also then understand um, that we have to pay closer attention to what does that mean when we do lockdown? How do we create um, services that are accessible to those in rural communities? How do we make them accessible to those people who may not be able to leave their home? And it's forced all of us to be a bit more creative and a bit more flexible in the way that we try and reach out to individuals. So this is where digital technology and creating community-based representatives who can facilitate as referral mechanisms have really flourished. Um, and that's something that will be sustainable beyond um, the, the global pandemic. So, so this is something that actually has been a, benefic a beneficial result of the realities of what happened. So I am ending on positive note. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you, Mel. And as you're just speaking so powerfully, I was reflecting that one of the positive things, of course, to come out of COVID is, is our connection virtually. So to have you here on this panel today is wonderful, to have your voice, to have that experience from your country and countries in your region. So thank you so much for that. Jane, I'm going to move on to you. Um, as we know, Australia is set to recover relatively well from COVID-19, but for so many low-income countries, the impact will be long-lasting. And of course, you've worked with um, communities and women right throughout the world. So talk us through some of those secondary impacts of COVID-19, particularly on poverty and inequality. And, and I'm thinking in particular how it relates to women and girls. Yes, thanks, Nakea. Uh, as you say, it's both poverty and inequalities that have been exacerbated by the impact of COVID-19 and conflict and climate change. And women have been at the front lines of impact and of response as health workers, as community workers, as caregivers. Uh, women also represent the majority of informal workers whose livelihoods have been decimated by COVID-19 and without any social protection or safety nets. And as Natasha and, and Mele have referenced, there's been a massive surge in gender-based violence 
with many women being trapped and isolated by their perpetrators. And many girls have lost the ability to be able to continue their education. And worse still, many have been forced into early marriage while others have been at greater risk of being trafficked due, due to the spiraling poverty and the desperation that many families are feeling at the moment. And compounding this are countries in Asia and other parts of the world that have used the pandemic as a tool to increase authoritarian rule and traditional values, which have further isolated and marginalized women and women's groups and, and networks. It's been really hard for women's networks and movements to be able to hold ground, um, let alone gain ground in terms of the rights secured. Um, and that's why pro uh, providing much more support to women's groups and networks is so vital at this time so that they have the funds and, and the networks and the infrastructure to be able to respond at times of crisis. And that said, women's groups and networks have been phenomenal in their response in creating safe houses for women, in organizing sanitation uh, stations, in emergency hotlines, in training women in tech to sustain livelihoods, in reorganizing education for girls and boys to sustain their study, uh, in undertaking outreach to some of the most marginalized communities, um, in supporting uh, the safe passage of migrant women workers returning home and ensuring their well-being. And I would also say uh, to Natasha's earlier point in addressing uh, gender norms, one of the things that we've also been supporting is a gender boys lab in India, um, working with boys in schools to be able to um, support them to be able to advocate to end gender-based violence, to take actions in their own community and to promote positive masculinities. And I really think there's huge potential in other parts of the world and in Australia. We've got to really start young with students in schools to be able to change um, attitudes towards gender-based violence. Thank you so much, Jane. There was a lot in that. It was rich and, and powerful. So thank you very much. In, in so many ways, um, COVID-19 has, has really given us a window into a world that's rapidly unfolding before us, a world that will be increasingly characterised by climate change where disruption is the norm and where once again, women are on the front lines. Jane, I'm gonna come back to you because you've got specific expertise in this area. Can you talk to us about um, why are women in particular disproportionately impacted by climate change? Why are they on the front lines? Well, I know this is something that's very close to your heart, Nagay. You've been a very fierce advocate for women's leadership in relation to climate change. Climate change is arguably the biggest issue of our time. And due to the gendered impacts of climate change and its disproportionate impact on women, women's climate leadership is really crucial to both strengthening climate resilience and advancing gender equality. And I'll just give you some examples of how women have been at the front lines. In Fiji, women have constructed climate resilient uh, homes as part of a Habitat for Humanity project there. Uh, in the Carteret Islands, uh, just near Papua New Guinea, women were actively involved in negotiating access to new land and livelihoods in Bougainville and arranging for the relocation of their whole community when their islands was, uh, was sinking due to climate change. In Nepal, uh, immediately following the major earthquakes there, women's groups came together to establish outreach circles to ensure that help was provided to the most vulnerable and isolated people and communities, especially those who are more at risk of violence and trafficking at a time of of conflict. And in several Asian countries, grandmothers are being trained as solar engineers at Barefoot College in India and, and Fiji. So they're being called the green solar wizards within their community. In other countries, women are leading uh, the right to breathe movements in response to growing uh, pollution caused by greenhouse gases and to, mar and to demand policy reform to protect lives. In India, women are, are leading important transboundary water governance work and using this experience to extend their leadership locally and, and nationally. And something that some of you may not realize in Bangladesh, where over 190,000 people died during its most devastating cyclone, over 90% 90, uh, 90 of them were women and girls due to the fact that it was male to male war early warning systems that shut out women receiving vital information. 
And so women's networks are now creating inclusive early warning systems, drawing on women's knowledge and, and leadership in Bangladesh, in Fiji, in other Pacific Island countries um, and around the world. And importantly, women are using their voice and knowledge to influence climate policies, uh, climate financing, and working to shift power and, and change structures and systems in support of uh, sustainable climate outcomes. So what we need to do is we need to get more money to grassroots women's groups and, and networks and movements that are organising on climate action and to advocate for more gender inclusive approaches to budgets, to policies and to climate finance. Thank you so much, Jane. So fascinating to hear women are not only on the front lines in terms of impact, but are right at the forefront as far as solutions and thinking creatively about how we tackle a significant structural challenge. So thank you for that. Um, we are so lucky today to be joined by Ari Goring, who not only understands how women are on the front lines of the issue of climate change, but is also herself a leader working with women right across this country in particular, but also the world to build the solutions. So Ari, tell us about your work and particularly how women, including Aboriginal and Indigenous women around the world, are playing an instrumental role in the transition to a climate resilient future. Mm, thanks, Nagaya. What a nice introduction. Um, I just want to start by recognising that, you know, without a healthy, thriving planet, um, we can't, we won't be able to live on this planet. So really investing in and thinking about climate change is such a priority and nurturing our environment is so critical to our future. So before diving into some great stories, I thought it might be great to take ourselves for a moment to the tall trees of a temperate rainforest to the open grasslands of the savannas, to a rich coastal ecosystem of seagrasses and mangroves and coral reefs. And just take a moment to think about when you visualize those places, do you see people? And I think for, you know, millennia indigenous communities have been stewarding these landscapes. Uh, and today they're responsible for managing more than 25% of the lands of the world's uh, land and seas. Uh, and within these landscapes, the remaining 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity exists. So they're really important landscapes for us to be investing in uh, and empowering particularly women in these landscapes to be managing uh, because the deep knowledge of those traditional practices is held in the diversity of language and indigenous languages in those landscapes. And it's the women who pass this knowledge and these languages on primarily to the next generation. And so we can see like in the Altamayo landscapes in Peru, uh, indigenous women are harvesting teas based on their medicinal knowledge of plants. Um, in India, um, we can see women in the Gulf of Maya uh, cultivating and harvesting medicinal seaweeds. In the northwest of Australia, women are harvesting honey uh, as well as fruits from medicinal plants. I mean, all of these products are coming into mainstream markets. But I really want to make a shout out to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, Indigenous women across the nation who are taking up ranger, uh, looking after country ranger roles. Um, and a great example of this from the Great Sandy Desert is the Nurura Ranger team, um, who are combining their traditional knowledge with new technology to be monitoring the impact of climate change. And by spending time with their cultural elders on country, that is facilitating learning and particularly learning around cultural fire practices. And so now these amazing women rangers out in very remote communities in our deserts are combining this cultural knowledge of fire practice with new technology like fire scar mapping. Um, and they're taking this knowledge together into the skies and flying in helicopters uh, and doing incendiary aerial burning and seeing the landscape from these two perspectives, from a cultural perspective, reading the landscape and from a Western science perspective, seeing the fire scars. But most importantly, they're sharing these stories with the kids in remote schools so they're inspiring this kind of new generation of 
Aboriginal scientists in remote communities who see the landscape both from their cultural perspective uh, and from a scientific perspective and are really strong and feel proud in their sense of identity. And I think for me, this is most critical because you can't be what you can't see. Uh, and that this grassroots innovation is a really important element to our transition to a climate resilient future. And it's not just the big stories, it's the small stories that are really important in that transition. Harry, thank you so much. As you were speaking, one of the comments came through that your introductory, um, your introduction was mm -hmm. took us from thinking up here in the brain and we all kind of centered ourselves in nature. So thank you for doing that with us. It was mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, Mele, I'm gonna move over to you over in Samoa. Um, of course, for so many Pacific Island nations, climate change is an existential threat. So talk to us about how women in particular in your community are responding to the issue. And also, we'd just love to hear how can we as Australian women support you and, and your fellow um, country people in, in the journey in, in really addressing climate change? Well, thank you. I feel like uh, I've been... I've been in a, a poetry scape, so I'm, I'm, I feel very centered. Uh, so I will have to enter back into my brain. Um, you know, for all of us in the Pacific, whether I speak from a Polynesian, Melanesian or Micronesian perspective, the reality is, is that um, climate change is on our doorstep. And sometimes it's actually swimming into our, our homes. So it's a reality that we face every day. Um, as you know, we have different seasons. We have a dry season, we have a rainy season, and we have a cyclone season. And what we've noticed just in the last decade is that cyclone season is much more um, extensive, it's much more violent, and it hits more than just one country. In 2018, TC Gita uh, hit Vanuatu, Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa. That was four countries. Now, when you're trying to do um, disaster response, we usually focus on one country at a time, but you can't do that with the way that um, climate change has changed dramatically how um, these storms affect the entire Pacific. And that affects not only how we respond um, as individual countries, but how also um, international regional organizations can respond as well. So I think it's a real slap in the face to all those who aren't living here when they realize, oh, I can't be in Fiji and Vanuatu and Tonga at the same time, which means that I have to understand the Pacific as a much larger, bluer continent than um, perhaps others have wanted to identify as just, you know, um, one, one island nation, which of course, you know, depending on the nation, you can have up to a thousand islands within that country. So, so we really do spread across the breadth of the Pacific. And from that, we have a title of different types of issues, whether it's from tsunami to earthquake, to cyclone, to flooding. Um, and all of us experience that to some degree. Um, of course, at the same time, we rely heavily on those of us in the community level because they're the ones who um, have to survive, irrespective of whether a policy or a law or a regional organization is paying attention. So, so there are lots of examples of um, women's committees getting together and trying to refurbish mangroves, which we know protect us not only from tsunamis and uh, inclement weather, but also are the breeding ground for so many of the foods um, and nature that we rely on. We also rely on women in the marketplaces to be more environmentally conscientious, banning styrofoam and plastic from their marketplaces or taking the green waste from their marketplaces and turning that into compost so that they can return it back to the soil and then they can reap the benefits from that. So always we have to rely on the wisdom of our elders and the actions of our youth to combine together to, to really try and find the solutions. So um, what I would love to see is more people investing in those types of initiatives where you are actually going into the communities, you're listening to what women are saying, and then you're actually facilitating them make those changes themselves. You know, Because the reality is people are going to try and save themselves irrespective of whether or not somebody else is paying attention. But if we're actually there to learn from them, to be able to share that amongst the different island nations around the world who may be experiencing these things, it, it then takes it to a different level. 
and um, it takes it to a level where you're not just focused on your own community, but you realize that you're part of the global community. And, and from that, all of, all of us benefit. So I think that's, that's my positive message. <laughs> Wonderful. It's good to have positive messages. We need them at the moment. And Meli, I, I especially want to acknowledge you because you've just talked about the incredibly important role of elders and young people. So that inclusion is so important. And of course, we all have something to bring to the table. So thank you so much for that. Um, as we've just heard from all of our speakers, women bring really unique strengths to the table. So Ari, I want to come to you and ask you, um, about women in decision making, in your experience, have you noticed the differences in the way women approach agreement making? Mm, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I was reflecting the other day how when I first started working at the Kimberley Land Council, my first job was as an admin assistant. So you can picture me, I was like 25, really keen to impress everyone, very organised and focused. And at the time, it was about 1998 and it was some of the first native title claims were being registered. Um, and the town of Broome where I lived was expanding and for the first time, traditional owners were engaged in these complex negotiations with um, land developers. And so this was all, there was a lot of negotiations that were happening at once. Um, and so part of my job was, and one of the women kind of cultural leaders uh, of the Yarrow community, took a liking to me, um, we'll call her Nabaru. she's passed away, uh, and she took, she liked me because I would pick her up for these meetings, um, and a lot of women didn't actually have cars, so they found it hard to get access or, or come to those negotiation meetings. But when I'd pick her up, she'd ask me to take her around and see all these people, and at the time I was feeling really irritated with that because I was thinking I've got all these meetings to organise and all these briefing notes to draft and agendas to print, um, and we'll be driving around to all these people's houses and I just see her having cups of tea. Uh, <laughs> and it took me a couple of months, quite a while actually really, if I'm honest, to realise what was actually going on. And what was happening was that she was negotiating with all the key leaders. She was going to visit people. She was talking to them about the meetings and about their cultural responsibilities and lining up the agreement so that in the meeting, she actually wouldn't talk. And that what happened was that people could come to agreement uh, much more quickly. And I reflected on this, um, I think it was about uh, 2018, I was at the Carbon Market Institute conference in Melbourne here in Australia. And um, Christina Figueres was the keynote speaker. And she talked about negotiating the uh, UNFCCC Climate Paris Agreement. And she talked about using the same strategy. And I guess it just really resonated that these two women from very different perspectives use the same negotiation strategies, um, you know, really seeking out collaboration, that approach to co-creation, aligning everyone towards a common vision of hope and a vision that they could all see themselves in. And I think women do that naturally uh, and we need more of it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ari. Just on that point of hope, I think I might lead us to a conversation around hope before I open it up for questions from the audience. Um, American author Rebecca Solnit, who I highly recommend uh, for those who haven't heard of her, she's phenomenal. She writes powerfully about the role of hope in driving social movements. She says, hope is not a lottery ticket. You can sit on the sofa and clutch feeling lucky. It is an ax you break down doors with in an emergency. Hope should shove you out the door because it will take everything you have to steer the future from endless war, from the annihilation of the earth's treasures and the grinding down of the poor and marginal. The hope is to give yourself to the future and that commitment to the future is what makes the present inhabitable. So I wanted to go to each of our panellists just briefly um, and ask quite a personal question, actually, which is where do you draw hope from or who do you draw hope from, particularly in this moment of great transformation when the stakes are very high? Ari, I'll start with you. I think I draw hope from the community of people that I work with. And, um, you know, I drew hope 
when I was in the Kimberley and the amazing women that I worked with there are from grassroots community. And then a year ago, I moved here to Melbourne to head up Pollination Foundation, which is part of a global climate advisory and uh, finance group, a very different community of people, um, but all just as passionate about this transitional climate resilient future and some really amazing young women within the organisation who are who are so passionate about yeah, this transition and what the future looks like. And it's a joy to co-create and come to work with them every day. Beautiful. Over to you, Mele. Sorry, I was all getting in, into that again. <laughs> I forget <laughs> sometimes that I'm not just in the audience. <laughs> uh, well, I mentioned it a little bit uh, about my the inspiration when I first spoke, but I'll give an example. So last night I went to a, an art gallery exhibition and it had 12 female Samoan artists participating. Now that's the second time in Samoa's history that there's been an all female art exhibition. The first one was held by the same um, Manamea Art Studio the year before. Uh, and in that art exhibition, I saw uh, new artists, women who'd been experienced artists for many decades, um, uh, those who considered themselves professional, those who were just wanting to use this uh, format as a, a means to express themselves and practice um, expression. Um, and we also had a reading from Lani Went Young, who's a well-known Samoan author. And we also had a welcoming talk by Zita Martel, who was the first female Fautasi skipper. Fautasi is a traditionally male activity with a lot of men in a boat, you know, um, speeding away. But she was able to lead her women's um, team to second place in a, a recent race. Um, and what was so beautiful was that um, all these different women from different ages, different backgrounds, different um, economic uh, places, different educational, some very worldly, some had only ever left their village, but we were all unified in celebrating each other and collecting in one place to appreciate each other and to uplift each other. And that is a beautiful thing anytime that happens. You know, this form uh, that we're in right now is another example of that. But I think it's intrinsically the power that women have because we will invite you to sit and have a cup of tea with us. And whoever you are at the table, you are welcome. And I think that's a beautiful thing. So that's, that was my source of inspiration recently. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm gonna hand over to Natasha. I'm thinking of, especially of Natasha given We've seen, uh, you know, so much um, additional violence against women and children in the last year, which has been harrowing. And in addition to that, as a former parliamentarian, this is not an easy time. So really keen to hear from you where you draw hope from. Uh, you're worried that I'm less diving into the future and diving under the doona at the moment. <laughs> because uh, I think it's been a bit of a bittersweet International Women's Day this year and week. But increasingly, like everyone, I derive inspiration from young people more and more so in all their diversity and difference and the way that they're challenging uh, concepts and old ways and standards. Um, I'm a proud product, as is Jane, of the women's movement here in South Australia and you too, Nagaya. And I, I, I always wanna pay tribute to my foremothers and sisters because that's a lot of where the energy um, and instruction comes from, dare I say. Um, but I also, I want to acknowledge that culture and nature is what sustains us all and is very therapeutic at times like this. Uh, Mele, I'm not sure if it's time for you to get out the ukulele, just saying, um, but there are a lot of those things and you've given us some literature and poetry and these things, you know, and Ari's, you know, evo you know evocative comments about the land and, and nature. All of these things, I think, make a difference to how we manage and how motivated we feel to to keep going, but I also know that uh, we have no choice and to create a fairer, greener, equal, respectful world, uh, we can't give up. And so supporting each other and Mela, you're right, on days like today, just hearing you all and remembering you and your good, wonderful work in the Pacific, which I miss, um, I think that makes a big difference. So I thank you and everyone in the chat box too. It's been very, um, it, it's quite energizing after an interesting few days. Thank you so much, Natasha. 
I'm very conscious of time. So Jane, I might hand over to you, but if you wouldn't mind just keeping it brief because I want to ask a final question of the, of the panel, panelists before we wrap up. Yeah, so I think what gives me hope is all women and men who are using their voices in the service of women's rights and gender equality, I think it's something that we can all do in cultivating our own voice and whether it's via social media or, or letters to politicians or standing for office or marching in the streets, uh, I think we all need to have the confidence and the courage to speak ourselves and to engage in those movements for change. Um, in the US, we have the Indivisible Movement and we have She the People, which supports principled feminist diverse um, candidates for office um, and I think we can cultivate our voice in many ways. I'm doing singing lessons with a, a phenomenal singer-songwriter from Melbourne, uh, Lucy Wise, and so that's uh, strengthening my voice and creativity and power and so I think that we can all practice that in, in really doing service to leading and influencing transformative movements for change. Thank you so much. We've had two really good questions come through from the audience. One is on climate change the other is what are the unique attributes that women bring to the table? So what I'm gonna actually do is take those two questions and actually wind it up in, in my final question for you all, which is the theme for this year's International Women's Day is about women in leadership. Um, we are facing multiple crises. We're facing COVID-19, we're facing climate change, and of course, rising inequality. We need women's leadership like never before. So I want us to move into a process of imagining. Um, and I'm gonna ask each of you to describe just one thing that you think um, how the world would look different had we had more women in leadership roles over the next 12 months. And I'll ask you just to complicate it a little bit further, one thing each of us can do to make sure that's a reality into the future. I might start with you, Mele. Goodness gracious, I'm trying to reduce it just to one. Um, I was just thinking that uh, if, if, if there were more women um, involved in leadership, I was thinking globally and locally, that uh, there'd be more honesty about what we have to do and what we have to face in order to find solutions. Um, mainly because um, we do know that statistically when women are on executive boards, et cetera, they're less likely to, to have um, uh, fraudulent activity, et cetera. But I also think it comes from a place of wanting to find healing and resolution as opposed to wanting to uh, rise above others. You know, uh, we talk about the negative um, male st uh, stereotyping that unfortunately uh, forces men into roles where they feel they have to compete with each other. Um, and this is not to negate a woman who wants to be ambitious and competitive in any way, shape or form. But we do more likely want to make sure that everybody who's sitting at the table has uh, a chance to voice uh, their concerns and also is fed, right? If a woman's uh, in charge of who's sitting at the table, nobody will go hungry, everybody will have a drink, and everybody will feel welcome. We can't always guarantee that when we're not the ones in control of who's at the table. Thank you so much. So Ari, one thing from you, what would be different Have we had more women in power over the last year? And one thing each of us can do to make that a reality into the future. I think I'm just gonna focus on this idea of diversity because women, uh, it's not just about more women, it's also about embracing diversity because if we're designing solutions, which we tend to do. We like to talk with people who look and speak the same way that we speak um, and have those same lived experiences as us. But this just kind of delivers the same outcomes that have got us to where we are today. So building this kind of hope for the future and a climate resilient future, we need to take new approaches uh, and create solutions that are founded on these diverse perspectives inclusive of local grassroots initiatives to global perspectives um, and this deep understanding that nature is critical to our life here on this planet. Mm -hmm. Here, here. Thank you, Ari. Over to you, Natasha. Well, Ari's right. I mean, unless we have our true difference and diversity reflected and represented in all institutions, in all positions of power and in community, then we won't see a real difference. The one statistic or piece of evidence that always comes out at me when we talk about more people generally and women specifically in positions of leadership 
not necessarily politics. It's not the only way to make a difference. I get that. But the evidence base is clear. When there are more women in leadership roles, there are better policies and practices to address violence against women and children. So that's only one aspect of all the good positive things that could come if we reflected better our diversity and difference. There are many others apart from being the right thing to do and the fair thing to do, but there are many other flow ones. And the other comment that Ari made earlier was, we can't be what we can't see. Well, clearly um, that role model impact is another great, well, I've said two now, but another great uh, side effect of more women in positions of power and more diversity being reflected in our society. So here's to it. Fabulous, thank you so much. Lastly, over to you, Jane. Yes, more diverse women in leadership would have ensured more perspectives from those who were some of the most impacted by COVID-19 and climate change. So the strategies would have been more reflective of the lived experiences of diverse populations. And so that approach ensures greater success of the solutions devised to save more lives, transform systems, and therefore ensure equity and justice for communities and countries. In terms of what we should all focus on now, we need to organize diverse candidates for office. Uh, the Indivisible Movement is a really powerful example. And we need to fund more feminist grassroots, grassroots movements for change. We need to get more funding to those groups leading the work on the ground. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. This has been such a rich and fabulous discussion. I'm going to hand over to Megan at Global Citizen. Thank you. Thank you once again, Megan, all of our wonderful speakers, Jane, Ari, Mele, Natasha, extraordinary conversation here today. Thank you to the Results Australia team for partnering with us on bringing this event to life. Anne and Emily, the tech wizards behind the scenes who made sure everything was seamless for us today. And thank you, our attendees. Um, in that chat, we, I saw people from Sydney, Japan, New York, Adelaide, Samoa, Brisbane, Timor-Leste, Fiji, the Central Coast in New South Wales and New Zealand. And it is a silver lining of these virtual times we find ourselves in. Thank you all for making the time to join us today and bringing, and bringing this event to life with us. It's been an honour to share International Women's Day with you. We hope you've learned at least one new thing or felt a spark for one issue you want to learn uh, more about today. If so, I'd love to encourage you to sign up to globalcitizen.org if you haven't already and find the content and actions that you feel the most passionate about and lend your voice to that cause because we know we are always louder together. Uh, don't forget to follow the organisations speaking today to learn more about their work. All their social handles are on the screen there. Uh, we will also send you an email with these links, including those of the um, speakers as well. So no need to remember them now. Just scan your inbox in the next day or so. Thank you once again, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. And we hope you'll join us for our next event during World Immunisation Week. Make sure you follow us on Facebook and have signed up to receive those details. Thank you once again, everybody, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Mm-hmm. <laughs>